Today on In Grace, we're in Israel to show you some incredible archaeological discoveries. Are you looking for hope? My amazing parents taught me to look for hope in the Lord, and that gave me a passion to explore God's incredible creation. I'm Jim Scudder, Jr. Let's go on an adventure together and find hope in grace. Last time on In Grace, we drove north from Jerusalem about 30 minutes to ancient Shiloh, the site of the largest archaeological dig in Israel. There, we talked with our friend Dr. Scott Stripling, provost of the Bible Seminary in Houston, Texas, and director of the Shiloh Dig. We learned about the cursed tablet Scott and his team found on Mount Ebal. And now we want to find out more about the latest discoveries here at Shiloh. But before we get a tour from Scott, we thought we should redo one of my favorite In Grace segments. In 2019, in part four of Joshua's Conquest, Scott tried to impress me with his UTV driving skills. Now Scott was bragging about his brand new, much improved machine. But this time, I insisted on driving. Ready? Now you're welcome to drive. I'm gonna let you drive. But for this shot, it needs to be me because last time. You're recreating the shot. Yeah. You, see, you understand? I, I see what you just okay. did. Okay. Yeah. So you ready? Yeah. Okay. Let's, go. Let's see if you can yeah. get if, it going a little faster if, than last time. If we needed four wheel drive, we've got it. But okay. You don't need four wheel drive. So you're treating this like a new car. I thought you would just scoot up the hill. So we. We've got this little turn up here. This is in high gear, so if we want to go into low gear, of course, we Did can. your grandmother teach you how to drive, Scott? No. Um, I'm self-taught, as you can tell. But the turtle does win the race eventually. <laughs> Okay. Wow. All right. Jim's going to drive. Lily, you can sit up front. Truly. Abigail and I will be backseat drivers. Okay. Okay. We're, we're at your mercy. Oh, man. All this was underground back in 2017. And now you look at this beehive of activity. We uncovered yesterday, well, we've been working on it for a long time, but I think we finally answered our question yesterday of where the gate is at Shiloh. All right, Jim, as of yesterday, I can now show you the entrance to the city of Shiloh. Wow. Wow. And uh, this is the entrance through which Joshua probably would have walked, very likely would have walked as he came into the gate complex of ancient Shiloh. So they took over Shiloh, didn't destroy it, just occupied it and started using it for Israel. That's right. The people at Shiloh were part of the Shechem city-state, and the Shechem city-state was at peace with the Israelites. In fact, they had embraced Yahwehism. And something else happened in the gate we'll talk about further up the gate complex yeah. um, that's every, a lot of people know about in the Bible if they've studied the Bible. Sure. Well, as, as we go through this gate, we're now picturing how people did in ancient times. Gates fun had a, a purpose of justice, economics, worship, and security. So this is to provide security, but also it's sort of a big flea market in the gate as well. You'll find archives in the city gate, so we're very alert and uh, you know, looking for cuneiform and things like this, because even the Amarna letters in EA 288 talk about the gate of Silu or Silu, which I believe was Shiloh, and it gives the guy's name. Two people actually were killed in the gate of Shiloh in this takeover, this Habiru, Hebrew takeover of the land. Huh. Two people were called by name, so wow. below our feet, who knows what's waiting. <laughs> so let's go into the city. So as you can see, it's massive, 5.3 meters wide. It had a huge mud brick superstructure on top of it, about 20 feet high that we've excavated through. And as we come into this area, you can see the symmetrical opening in the wall that we've uncovered 
So you're coming through this gate arm area and now into the wall itself. So you talk about Rahab living on the wall. These people are working on the wall. This gate chamber apparently is in the wall. And from here, we have to finish excavating to see how they went up into the city. The big event that happened here in the Bible was Eli. Right, so Eli gets tragic news. His sons are dead and the Ark of the Covenant has been captured by the Philistines. It's the worst possible news that he could get. He's aged at this point and in grief, he falls over backward, breaks his neck and dies. And uh, we are probably very close to where that happened. What a sad story. Yeah. Yeah, and from here, Samuel leaves, the ark is taken, and it's not ever going to be reunited because the table of the presence of the bread of the Lord ends up at Nob, the brazen altar is at Gibeon, the ark of the covenant ends up in Kiriath Yarim, and it's not until David brings that to Jerusalem and then Solomon builds the temple that it's all reunited again. The gate at Shiloh is hugely important the monumental building, of course, that matches the dimensions of the tabernacle. We have significantly clarified that this season. We now have our southern wall, so we can say with a higher degree of certainty that this appears to have been where the tabernacle was located. I think to me that is maybe the most important thing is this, this platform. Yeah. So. If you could point that out to me from here so I really can picture it, give me the sure. dimensions of this. Okay, so this wall right here is our wall 10, and you can see that it's east-west, the sun's rising, that's due east, so guess where the wall is? Okay. So this is east-west. That's what caught my eye in 2017. It's a large wall, 1.2 meters wide. It's from the period of the tabernacle, and um, so I was just, keeping my eye on it, so to speak. It goes all the way through to the corner over there. It seems like it's missing, but it's not. That's a wall that we removed, and down at the bottom, we still have the foundation of the wall. So that's where it starts, and it comes all the way through. We just yesterday found the end of it. So way over where those sandbags are, that's the end of that. So that's a long wall. We got the perpendicular wall in 2018, see this? Yes. Okay, so that began to emerge. Well, now I was more interested. And then we got another perpendicular wall in the next season. So now we had enough that my theory was shaping up. Is this the platform of the Tabernacle at Shiloh? Because it's an east-west monumental size building. So what I did is I took the dimensions given in the Bible for the Tabernacle and I superimposed them on our drone shot of this area. We didn't yet have the Southern Wall and it was a spot on fit. And this then was the Holy of Holies and this was the holy place. And of course, I mean, pretty much in shock at this point, like you gotta be kidding me. Do we have the platform of the tabernacle? Now we've got the entire section here, Southern Wall, Northern Wall, Western Wall, Eastern Wall, of the Holy of Holies. And then the wall, it continues on on a ratio of two to one. So it's twice as large out there as it is in here. It all starts with the text itself. In 1 Samuel uh, 3, at the beginning of the chapter, you're reading about the curtains of the tabernacle. By the end of the chapter, you're reading about the walls of the tabernacle. Okay. And the door, delet, the door of the tabernacle. So the language in the, in the Bible is suggesting change. Then the Mishnah in two places tells us that there was a platform for the tabernacle built that had stone walls and a tent over it. So it's a quasi tabernacle tent. I see. Why they chose to do that, we don't know, but you know, sure. we've got the biblical account, we've got the Mishnah, and then archeology span comes in and we clarify and apparently they were right. Okay. That seems to be what we're finding. And this is where Samuel is when he's hearing the voice of God and this is where Eli's interacting with him. The bones, if you walk due east of here, about 30 seconds, you'll come to area D, and that's where we have the favisa of bones. So this again makes sense. You're leaving the building and that's where you find it. Ceramic pomegranates found here, altar horns found here, storage rooms right next to it. So add it all up, bone deposit, monumental building, ceramic pomegranates, altar horns, and storage rooms, 
and I think you've got a pretty good idea of what it was like. In these next few seasons, these would be the seasons people should volunteer. Oh, yes. Because it's going to be amazing oh, yes. what's going to be found here. They should volunteer and they should send us money. Uh, yeah. These are these In are that the, order or reverse uh, the either order? Way. Yeah, yeah, either way. Okay. Either way. So you're standing in a really, really interesting spot. Yes, and you know what? A few days ago I came and volunteered, you know. Yes, all that's of right. My amazing abilities and talents. It's quite impressive. And I got to dig in the Holy of Holies. Bible prophecy is so incredible. I'd love for you to know more. When you get Armageddon's Dawn, the prophecy chart, this will really help you understand the panorama of end times prophecy. If your gift is $35 or more, let me also send you the entire Armageddon's Dawn video series and a book about the Antichrist, The Coming World Leader. Get this amazing prophecy chart for your gift of any amount. If your gift is $35 or more, we will also include the full eight-part video series. And if you act right now, we will also include The Coming World Leader. Call 800-78-GRACE right now or go to ingrace.tv to receive this limited time offer. We decided to volunteer Possibly. since we had a little extra time while we're filming. Yes. And Morning, here at Shiloh, How's Blue Team doing? so much history here. It's so awesome. Awesome, what you got? So they've assigned me to kind of clean out this little TV corner. people and everything. There were some rocks that yeah. were trying to, I found these. these rocks okay. that have fallen down in here. We're trying to find the bottom of this wall and then it'll verify something for them. So putting the dirt into this pail, this will get sifted and all the rocks will get uh, moved out. The reason that this area is important, if this is the tabernacle platform, this would be the Holy of Holies. So they're saying sift everything that you find. Can you imagine that? The Holy of Holies in this area. You know, you get busy working and you take it for granted of where I am, but I always stop and think about Psalm 102, 14. Blessed are those who love your dust and cherish your stones. And for me, it's a huge honor, and for my team, it's a huge honor to be working here. Well, let's go look at Area D. All right, let's go. I was sifting here last week. That's right. So I know this area very well. I like your wheelbarrow. I know you haven't <laughs> replaced it. <laughs> Well, if folks would send us some donations, we could get another wheelbarrow. Tell me about these bones, and these were just found today. Yes, these are coming fresh out of the ground. We're in Area D where we have this rich bone deposit from the biblical sacrificial system. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Each one of these animals was pointing to a future sacrifice that would ultimately expiate our sins. But um, in the meantime, people like Hannah and Elkanah, through this sacrificial system, were able to maintain relationship with God and with each other. These are sheep, goat, and cattle primarily. Everyone will be tested zooarchaeologically. We'll know if it's right side, left side, male, female, age at the time of death, uh, if there's evidence of cut marks, burn marks, and so forth. And you can carbon date. That's right. Yes. We'll extract collagen from these bones, and that will assist us in the dating process as well. We've got clear datable pottery, but now this will just be an extra dating metric that we'll add to it. The bone deposit was first excavated by Israel Finkelstein, and that was around when, when did he do his uh, 1980 to 1984, they okay. did four seasons, and uh, Finkelstein did some squares in Area D, and it was a clear five ESA. So he had thousands of bones and many restorable vessels that they found. Now here's where interpretation comes in. So he did good archeology span and documented that two thirds of the bones were from the right side of the animal, one third were from the left side of the animal, but he didn't give any interpretation to that. Um, of course, as a Bible reader, your mind immediately goes to Leviticus seven, that the right side is the priest's portion. But in Professor Finkelstein's mind, these Israelites did not arrive until much later, or they emerged from the native population or whatever his theory is. So he took this as clear evidence of a Canaanite sacrificial system at Shiloh. He thought that when the Israelites did arrive, they scraped the top of the summit and removed this deposit and dumped it over there. 
My view is very different. I think this matches with great precision the date of Joshua's arrival and that you have clear evidence of an Israelite sacrificial system and the right side, left side ratios are, are I, I think that seals the case. We also have items like this. When people have gold in ancient times, they don't lose it. If gold is, is left behind, it's intentional. It's an offering of some kind. We have found two gold stars in area D. And this one was just a few hours ago. And this was from wet sifting. So look, look how it. finely made that is. Very thin, very finely made. It's an eight-sided star. Only one of the, the points is missing. And uh, it's just, just absolutely beautiful. Amazing, look at that. So the star's in a very ancient symbol. You know, back Joseph is talking about the sun and the moon and the 11 stars and looking at the stars and understanding the stars. So having this star in this sacred deposit is something we're gonna be thinking about and trying to understand. That's amazing. Isn't that beautiful? Is the other one uh, more intact or about the yeah, same? Yeah, it's about the same. It has a hole in the middle and the the uh, the rays are less projected than okay. that. So slightly different, but I think you've got the same motif, definitely from the same time period. As an archeologist, the potential, mm -hmm. right? What What's still underground? And you're only <laughs> just scratching the surface of a site too. Yeah. How, what do you feel about the anticipation when you're at a dig like this? Yeah, it's extremely exciting for me. Um, this is an artifact rich site and it's a historically rich site. So now that we've worked here for years and worked in this region for many years, um, we've had a good handle on the stratification and we can anticipate what we're finding. And as it lines up inductively, more and more, then I think we see a very clear picture of what life was like in biblical times here at ancient Shiloh when people like Hannah and Elkanah came, just like us. You know, they had their issues and problems. They needed to reconnect with each other, reconnect with God through the sacrificial system. We can now do what Jeremiah 7, 12 says, go now to Shiloh where I first caused my name to dwell. See what I did and make it known. I appreciate Scott, our friendship and all the work that you're doing. You got a great team. <laughs> well, thanks. You're now part of it. You, your crew has come and, we, and shed your blood with us. We, we dug a little bit and it's just fun. I mean, uh, for a pastor, I, I talk about the Old Testament all the time, obviously, while I preach, but now I get to touch the Old Testament, you know, dirt and, and I um, didn't find much but I know where things aren't. <laughs> I, I think I contributed. Well, we've got to go, we have to work the system. Yeah. And if you work the system, then it leads us to what we need. Yeah, well, yeah. appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you, brother. Appreciate it. It's been great to be back at Shiloh here in Israel. I love the feeling of this place because this is where Israel was really birthed as a nation. This was the capital. Uh, this was where the tabernacle was. And they're finding evidence of these things. Uh, this tabernacle would have stood here for hundreds of years. The temple and the tabernacle that it replaced is all a part of a system of ceremony and sacrifice. And you say, well, why was that so important then and we don't practice it now? Well, there's this very simple reason because Jesus came, he was the perfect man because he was God, but he was man because he was born of Mary. He entered into humanity to do something we couldn't do. You see, the Bible talks about the blood of bulls and goats not being able to take away sin. The sacrifices would cover sin and it would, it would help the, the Israelites to have a right relationship with the Lord in fellowship but to, to expiate our sin, to take away our sin, it required a perfect sacrifice, which would be a human sacrifice. Jesus came and he fulfilled all of the types of the tabernacle, the temple, the sacrifices, the feast days, the prophecies, every one in every detail he fulfilled. Therefore, he is the one that will bring us into an eternal right relationship with God the Father. That's the good news. It, we can't save ourselves. And you can come and sacrifice year after year after year, and you still won't be able to be forgiven of your sins, the penalty of your sins, 
which is separation from God. To be reconciled back to God, you have to receive the gift of the, the final sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. So from Shiloh, may I offer you, as God has offered you, to receive a gift. The gift is called eternal life, and it's by grace that you're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me show you an illustration that my dad used to use all the time, and some of you remember him on TV. He would use his wallet, and he would use his hands. He would say, let my left hand represent you and me, and my wallet to represent sin. Let my right hand represent Jesus Christ. And, and he was perfect, he had no sin, but watch what he did. He came and was made sin for us. That's in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. That we might be made what? The righteousness of God in him. In other words, he came and paid for our sins on the cross, and now he's offering out his hand. And all you have to do is take your hand of faith and put it into God's hand. In other words, to receive the gift is just to believe, to trust in him. And when you do that, what happens? You have eternal life, you're in the hand of God, and that can never change. That's the greatest news in the entire world, that Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets, and he offers you eternal life by simply putting your full trust and faith in him. Bible prophecy is so incredible. I'd love for you to know more. When you get Armageddon's Dawn, the prophecy chart, this will really help you understand the panorama of end times prophecy. If your gift is $35 or more, let me also send you the entire Armageddon's Dawn video series and a book about the Antichrist, The Coming World Leader. Get this amazing prophecy chart for your gift of any amount. If your gift is $35 or more, we will also include the full eight-part video series. And if you act right now, we will also include The Coming World Leader. Call 800-78-GRACE right now or go to ingrace.tv to receive this limited time offer. Don't miss next week as Jim Scudder Jr. rafts the Colorado River looking at the evidence for creation. I survived my first Grand Rapids. The Colorado River, even in flood, doesn't have the power to clean out its channel. If it was millions of years of Colorado River water flow, how could it possibly carve out the canyon? Record every single In Grace episode. You will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's Word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.